Well, good evening to you. Welcome to our <coughs> worship this evening again. Uh, we begin our worship by hearing uh, God's word from Psalm 95, where he calls us to come and worship him. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pastor and the sheep of his hand. May God bless us as his sheep this evening as we meet in his presence and trust that he will be gracious and merciful to us. We'll begin our time of worship this evening by taking our psalters or following the words on the screen for Psalm 55. Psalm 55, and we're singing together stanzas one to four and then seven and eight. Psalm 55 stanzas one to four and then seven and eight. And the tune is number 67, Quantum. If you have the words in front of you, you will see that in stanzas one uh, and uh, two, we have a very sincere prayer for help. The psalmist is crying unto God. He's deeply distressed. He is downcast. We might say in our modern language, he is depressed. Why? Because he's surrounded by enemies. The wicked are troubling him. They are showing there and evidencing their hate for him. And then in stanza three, uh, he moves on to uh, describe again his anguish of his heart. Death's terrors have fallen on him. He is afflicted by deep fear and trembling and dread. Indeed, in stanza four, he uses very poetic words to describe how he just wishes that he could disappear out of this situation. Like a dove, he could just fly away from his situation in life, like he'd find somewhere quiet to rest. This, of course, is the experience of the psalmist. It was the experience of Christ. And later on in this psalm, in verse 10, we have a, a verse that is fulfilled in Judas's betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we thought about this morning, it is not unusual for us as God's people, as the church, to face opposition and hostility. And it can get to us. That's what this psalm describes. It describes uh, one of God's children who has reached his, the end of his teller almost because of the opposition he faces. When we go on to sing in stanza 7 and 8, we'll see that this pressure upon him. The, the enemy's hate is relentless. Day and night upon the walls of the city they surround. Uh, trouble and inequity within her they are found and various calamities and their endless stanza it says they just never come to an end. Friends, there's no in the stanzas we're singing there, there's no let up. And the main point I want us to take from this psalm is that it is part of the experience of God's people that we will go through times of despair. We are not immune to that. We see it in the psalmist. We see it in Christ. We see it probably in almost every godly character in Scripture. And so it is not strange for us to face such times as that. But our subject this evening will be, how do we live faithfully through times like that? Well, we'll get to that in due course. But let us address the Lord in a song now and sing these stanzas together, Psalm 55, 1 to 4, and then 7 and 8. And after we sing, I'll lead us in prayer this evening. Let us come and worship God.
Well, let's come to God in prayer this evening. Our Lord and Father, we thank you for the honesty and the transparency that the psalmist so often presents to us in his poems and in his songs. We're thankful that he, uh, under inspiration of your spirit, was brave enough and courageous enough to write down so often of the very many trials and tribulations that he faced. Not just the, uh, not even sometimes the historical circumstances, but the feelings of his heart, the, uh, the eggings of his heart, the, the troubles of his mind, his worries and his concerns. But we're also very thankful that even as we would read later on in Psalm 55, that he shows us the right way to deal with these things, to cast our cares and our burdens upon you, the Lord, for you care for us. We are thankful that we have you as our God, the only true and living God, the one who is interested in every aspect of our lives. You are the good shepherd to us. You're the one who uh, looks after the sheep. You're the one who uh, cares for us, who watches out for dangers, who protects us, who guides us, who feeds us, who meets all of our needs. And so, as we heard from Psalm 95, as we, in the call to worship, we approach you as our great God, and we praise your name, and we seek your face, for who better can we come to for help and mercy and grace in a time of need? We're thankful that these uh, psalms also represent to us not just the, the trials and the tribulations of David or uh, of some other author, but in reality, they point us to the experience of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here in this psalm again, we uh, see the reality and something of the content of that truth that is represented in the prophecy of Isaiah, that he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Surely that is what we see him experiencing in these uh, words of Psalm 55. Ever uh, surrounded by enemies who are ever planning his demise and ultimately do indeed arrest him and charge him falsely, and have him slayed and crucified. We look upon what he went through, both on the cross and before that, and we are filled with admiration and love for him. He has given so much that we who are his people may escape the wrath of his Father. We're thankful that he was willing to humble himself and take the form of a servant so that we may be exalted to the place of kings. We thank you, Lord, that he was willing to suffer such opposition and even the betrayal of those who were his companions. We pray, Lord, that we might walk worthy of such love and such grace as he has supplied to us. Lord and Father, we thought this morning about how uh, we are facing increasing hostility in our world. And this evening we turn to think more about that subject. And we pray, Lord, that as we consider how David uh, suffered opposition and hostility in his life and how at times he took wrong turns, we pray that we might learn from him. We pray that we might uh, learn how to cope with uh, the, the unrelenting pressure of living in a fallen world and all that that means to us. We are people who face the, the trouble that our own indwelling sin, our own remaining st sin still causes us. We face people every day who uh, have no time for you or for your law. We face the temptations of Satan and these three enemies, the world and the flesh and the devil, assault us unrelentingly. We pray that as we consider your word this evening, that you would help us to be as unrelenting in our steadfast faith in you 
and trust in you and in your protection and in your care that we might be stronger and more equipped to face those hostile forces in the weeks that come. We pray, Lord, that you will come again by your spirit this evening and that you will bless our worship together. Take of that living word and make it live in us. Make it live in our minds. Make it live in our hearts. Make it live in our whole lives so that we walk according to that which we hear. So bless us, we pray, Lord, and forgive us for our many sins as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want us to uh, turn to two passages of Scripture this evening. Um, slightly uh, different kind of a sermon in a way from this morning's where we were working our way through a uh, text. Uh, the first uh, reading I want us to read together is from 2 Corinthians and chapter 4. And then our main text will be in 1 Samuel chapter 27 and really just two verses from that chapter the first two verses but we'll turn first of all uh, to second corinthians and chapter four and we're reading the section there that's particularly the very well known section uh, where paul describes himself and all his fellow servants of christ as jars of clay or vessels of clay and he describes the the, the various sufferings that he went through and yet professes and confesses that in them all God was ministering to him and upholding. He felt the pressure, he felt the opposition very physically in his own body at times, but yet he was also conscious that the Lord was with him. And that will uh, form a good background then for us to consider what we read in 1 Samuel chapter 27. So let's read from verse 1 through to 12 of 2 Corinthians in chapter 4. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants. For Jesus' sake, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. And this is God's holy and infallible word. And when we turn just to our main text in 1 Samuel chapter 27, 1 Samuel chapter 27, and we read just verse 1 and 2. Then David said in his heart, now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So David arose and went over, he and the 600 men who were with him, to Achish, the son of Maroch, 
King of Gath. Amen. Well, the title of this evening's sermon is David's Despair, Its Causes and Its Cure. David's Despair, Its Causes and Its Cure. There, there's that well-known saying that I'm sure we're all familiar with, no news is good news. Well, if there is any accuracy to that saying, then there is very little good news because no matter what way we turn, there is a heap of news being presented to us. There's newspapers printed every day. There is 24-hour news channels on TV if you want to watch them. There's hourly news breaks on the radio and on TV. There is an ever-constant stream of news. And very little of it is good news. At the world level, of course, we are hopefully not in the middle of, but coming out of this, uh, what's been called a worldwide pandemic, coronavirus, COVID-19, something that I'm sure none of us have ever experienced in our lives quite like this. Apart from coronavirus, or just before coronavirus, all the news was about the impending doom of Brexit, which never seems to be mentioned now at all. Previous to that, or at the same time as that, we had uh, the, the environment was the big thing in the news, and we were heading towards some kind of climate catastrophe. And in the meantime, we had wildfires over in Australia and the ever-present uh, possibility of terrorism in our streets. There's plenty of bad news to get us down. And then at a local level, even within our own province, we have economic and political uncertainty because of Brexit and for a number of other reasons. And of course, very much looming in our minds this week is the moral degradation of our nation, where Westminster has again uh, enforced and put its full uh, pressure behind this uh, terrible abortion legislation. And then we have all the other relationship education issues, uh, transgenderism and immorality and so forth. All these things are constantly being uh, thrown up before us. And then we turn to the situation in the church. And as often as not, while there are plenty of encouragements, there's no big encouragements, are there? Or so it seems to us. It seems that church attendance is on an ever steepening downward slope. Sabbath keeping is a very rare thing, even among Christians. The willingness and desire of professing Christians to live holy lives is diminishing as well. There seems to be compromise all around, compromise with the ways of thinking and acting and living the same as the world. We face difficulty and danger and worry and concern and anxiety every day as we turn on the TV or listen to the radio in the car or lift a newspaper. And we haven't even started talking about the discouragements that can come to us as we fight our own remaining sin and face temptation. And we haven't got to th think yet about the discouragements that we face in the outreach ministries of our church. We perhaps give out thousands of invitations every year for years and relatively few are taken up. We seem to make little impact upon our neighbourhoods. The work is moving forward slowly, if it's moving forward at all. Do you ever get fed up with it all? Do you ever get to that point where the psalmist was in Psalm 55 that we, we sang at the beginning where we just wish that we could take our wings and fly away and leave it all behind? Do you ever get discouraged with it all? Do you ever get weary with it all? Do you ever wish it would just all go away? Well, David did. David certainly did. He did in Psalm 55, 
and he is certainly feeling that way at the beginning of 1 Samuel chapter 27. That's exactly where he's at in our text. He is deeply discouraged. He's at the end of his teller. He's almost, to use another phrase that sometimes he's, he's almost at his wit's end as to what to do. He's in despair. He's fed up with it all. And he wants to leave it all behind. And he tries to do that by going to the Philistines. As we'll see, it's quite a sad text. It's, it's sad that God's anointed has come to this point. It's a disappointing text in many ways. And yet, like all of Scripture, it's given for our instruction, our rebuke, our correction, our teaching, and so forth. And we should be glad that we have these uh, uh, disappointing texts, if you want, in our Bibles, because they're helpful to us. They, they warn us. They, they show us what's within ourselves, even if it hasn't come to the surface yet. But as we think about what happened to David, it will also encourage us, I believe. It will encourage us to, having seen our own weakness, to look more clearly and firmly and permanently towards Christ for strength. It will help us to face difficult circumstances. David, as we encounter him here in 1 Samuel 27, 1 and 2, is concerned, he's weary, he's despairing, and there are real reasons why he might feel that way, but I want us to think about how he didn't need to take the drastic negative action that he did. I want us to see that there was a better course and that actually what David says to himself here in his heart is very uncharacteristic of David. And he ought not to have said this, given what actually has taken place in the chapters before this. We're going to see that there was a different perspective that David should have taken on all the events that had happened to him. But before we look in detail at uh, his, his words, I want us just to make an observation here. This is a, the first point this evening, and it's just to observe this, that this is David who is in despair. It's David the man after God's own heart who is in despair. And that alone is a very instructive and helpful truth just to sit back and think about. David, the man after God's own heart, the great king of Israel, the psalm singer, the psalm writer, the prophet, he's the one who is in despair in verse 1 and 2 of 1 Samuel 27. That's how David is described in 1 Samuel 13 and verse 14. The Samuel speaks to, to Saul and tells him that your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and that man is David. It's that David who is in our text here overcome by pessimism. It's that David who finds himself in what he seems to measure as a hopeless situation. Look at what he says in, in verse 1. Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Think about what David's saying there. I am definitely going to die at the hand of Saul. There is no other possibility. There's no other possible end outcome for me than that. And there's only one thing that's left for me to do, and that is to go to my arch enemies. That just shows you how, how far he has fallen into despair, that he thinks going to the Philistines of all people is a good idea. This is David, who, who slayed tens of thousands of enemies compared to the thousands that Saul had slayed. At this point in his life, David seems unable to see any light at the end of the tunnel. And it leads him to make this very poor decision to go to the Philistines. This is David we're talking about. He's not some kind of wimpy, quivering lily of a character. He, he, this is David who slayed Goliath. 
This is David who, while well, yes, he was a very artistic person and a poet and a very spiritual man, as the Psalms present to us, he was not some kind of bookish character. He, he was a mighty warrior as well. He, was the, he would become the great king of Israel. This was David who from his youth had killed bear and lion as he protected his father's sheep. This is David, the one man in God's people, God's army, who was willing to take on the Philistine champion Goliath. But as we see him here at the beginning of 1 Samuel chapter 27, it seems that all that courage, all that uh, strength of faith has left him. He's struggling. And that fact, just observing that it's David who is saying these words, the great David who is saying these words, that is a helpful warning to us. It teaches us, no matter who we are, it teaches us that we must ever be on our watch out for despair. We must ever be on the watch out for despair. It can hit us suddenly, it can hit us swiftly, it can hit us powerfully, and it can hit us even when things are going well. In fact, if you scan back to the, the, the last verse of the previous chapter, uh, we, we can read there in 1 Samuel 26, 25, that actually... Uh, the, the big problem that David has been facing, of course, is the opposition of Saul. But, but that relationship has warmed up a little bit. It, it's quite good just immediately before David says what he says in, in verse 1 of 27. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things and will succeed in them. So David went his way and Saul returned to his place. And immediately, even at that uh, when things were going relatively well, immediately he struck with this despair. We see that that uh, uh, aspect of despair in Elijah as well. When, when is it that Elijah falls into a great despair? It's immediately after that great victory for Jehovah, where uh, the Baal prophets are shamed and destroyed, and the glory of God is displayed on Mount Carmel. Both these incidents teach us that this kind of discouragement and weariness can hit the strongest of believers, the strongest of Christians. David was a man of faith. He was a man of courage. He was a man of wisdom. But this incident shows us that even he, at least at this one time, was attacked and almost overcome by fears and doubts. We could see that in Abraham as well. Doesn't he twice in a somewhat cowardly, self-protective fashion, lose faith in God and lie about who his wife Sarah is? This incident here teaches us and that with Abraham and that with Elijah as well, that teaches us that despair and discouragement and weariness can hit the most spiritually sensitive Christians. David was acutely spiritually sensitive. Read the Psalms. He is the man after God's own heart. He walked close with God. See how, how desirous he is of, of uh, building the temple, as we thought about this morning. How important faith and faithfulness was to him. He was a, a conscientious believer, but conscientious believers can still be struck with despair. And this incident also teaches us that this kind of despair and discouragement and weariness can strike the most theologically mature and well-instructed Christians. David was a prophet, directly inspired by God. And yet even so, at this point, he was struck down with fears and doubts. Here's a temptation, Berlin, that we all have to watch out for. Yes, it's true. Some of us will be naturally optimistic characters. Some of us will be naturally upbeat and strong in faith. It doesn't matter. We need to watch out for this kind of despair. 
Some of us, of course, will be more glass half empty people. We will have a more pessimistic outlook in life. We certainly need to watch out for this kind of despair and defeatism. We all must watch and pray lest we enter into this temptation. Regardless of our mentality, regardless of our personality, regardless of our present level of faith, regardless of our gifts, regardless of our knowledge of scripture, regardless of our knowledge of our own spiritual health and our vulnerability, we need to watch out for the approach of discouragement and despair. If it can happen, David, the man of God, the man after God's own heart, it can happen to you and it can happen to me. But we move on to think now, secondly, about why David falls into this bout of despair. What has caused it? What? Surely there must be some background reasons and causes as to why the man who wasn't afraid of bear uh, and, and lion and wasn't afraid of Goliath and wasn't afraid of Saul so many times. Why is it that at this point in his life he has fallen into this despair? What has caused it? Well, secondly, let's look then at the causes of David's despair and some suggested cures. The causes of David's despair and some suggested cures. And I think we can detect two main causes of his despair at this time. And at least maybe something that we need to especially watch out for in our day. The first cause, I believe, of David's despair is the relentless pleasure, pressure of hostility. The relentless pressure of hostility. We have to appreciate, we have to appreciate the situation that David had faced now for a prolonged period of time. And we have to give him some sympathy. We may, and I hope you will uh, agree with me at the end, that, uh, that he's, he's, he's not stepping wisely or faithfully here. But nevertheless, we have to have some sympathy with him. Saul, the sitting king of Israel, has pursued him and pursued his life relentlessly. Now and again, even as we just read about in chapter 26, now and again that pressure abated, but it was pretty much constant. Saul was extremely unpredictable. You remember how one time in, in the past David was playing music for Saul and Saul was calm and then the next moment he gets the javelin and just throws it and misses David by a whisker. That was kind of how it was with Saul and living with Saul. But if you were to scan back through the previous chapters, especially from chapter 16, where David is anointed king, you will find that it's just one incident after another. David is always staring death in the face. He stares death in the face with Goliath in chapter 17. And from that moment on, Saul begins to hate him. In chapter 18, he tries to entrap David. He, he, David asks for Michael, Saul's daughter, as wife. And uh, Saul sends him off on an almost impossible task to win her as his wife. And of course, David prevails. But Saul's intention was that David would die. In chapter 19, we have the javelin incident where Saul almost pins him to the wall. And then there's a nighttime attack on David's home. In chapter 21 and 20, he barely escapes having been betrayed for, by Doeg the Edomite. And then in chapter 23 and 24, we have those two narrow escapes as he is trapped in the same cave as, David, as Saul and in the wilderness of Zeph. It's like an adventure story, but put yourself in David's possession, relentless, relentlessly being pursued by an unstable, ruthless enemy. 
And that relentless pressure has point to have had an eroding effect upon David's faith, a wearying effect upon him. It has worn him down. Throughout all these chapters, he has shown faith and courage, but at this point, the pressure has got to him. That's the warning to us. We can do well under the pressure. We can remain faithful under the pressure, but sometimes we reach a tipping point. Regardless, I'm sure all of us at this moment as Christians feel the relentless pressure of opposition to our very way of life. Relentless pressure upon our core belief that God exists. Relentless pressure uh, against our, our morals and our ethics. It doesn't matter uh, almost what time you turn on the radio or the, the TV, there will be a discussion or a, a, a set of questions or someone speaking who in some way will offend our Christian sensibilities. There will be some discussion promoting abortion. There will be some discussion promoting homosexuality and same-sex marriage. There will be some uh, flippant entertainment program that promotes adultery. Is not all of this the attack of Satan? Always putting pressure on us. Are not all these things Satan's javelins thrown at us to pin us against the wall, to try and erode our faith, to try and erode our holiness, to dilute our devotion to God? The pressure of facing these things day in and day out can sow the seeds of doubt and discord in our own hearts. In our church life, in our outreach, we can work hard, we can invite people, we can knock doors, we can uh, uh, have contacts with people, and they, sometimes they just never come to fruition, and we get weary in our well-doing. And then we have that conflict with sin, our own sin, that seems to be relentless. Sometimes it feels as if we're taking a few steps forward, but then we just take a few steps backwards. We get weary of it and we get despairing of it. We lose hope of it ever changing. And then we just have the physical challenges of getting older, of sickness, of worrying circumstances, of family troubles. The pressure can get us down. That's what was happening, David, here. The attacks on David were relentless, and they have reached his tipping point. And he can see no way out. But you know, all David needed to do, that I say all, not to uh, make it seem that it was easy. It's not easy, but it is the thing we need to do. All David need to do, needed to do was to think about his past from a different perspective. He was looking at it from the perspective of the unrelenting attacks. What he should have been looking at was the unrelenting grace that had preserved him through all those attacks. Because you see, as relentless as Saul's attacks on David were, Every bit as relentless had God's grace been towards David, such that he's still alive even to say these words in chapter 27. That's the point that Paul is making in 2 Corinthians. He had all manner of things happen to him. He was attacked, he was hurting, but he was not defeated. He was knocked down, but God's grace rose him up again. He faced all those difficulties, but the Lord was with him. That's the perspective we need to look at opposition from. Yes, we have faced opposition, but God has been with us. 
We will face opposition, but God will be with us. Time and again in the Psalms, that's what we see. We see a prayer for God's help, and then we see a retelling of how God has helped in the past, and then we see a recovery of faith and devotion to God, basically saying, yes, I'm in trouble now, I'm going to be in trouble in the future, but God has helped in the past and he'll help again. That's what David should have done, but he didn't at this point. You see, when you go back through those chapters again and look at it from the perspective of God invisibly working for to, for, to protect David, then you get a different picture. God was with David, relentlessly guiding that stone into Goliath's skull. Relentlessly protecting him in every battle and skirmish against the Philistines. In chapter 18, it was God who relentlessly gave him victory over the Philistines so that he could gain Michael as a wife. In chapter 19, how was it that Saul, who was a skilled soldier himself, how was it that he missed David? It was because God had guided that javelin past David's head and relentlessly into the wall behind him. How was it that David heard a report of that secret nighttime attack and was able to escape? The Lord was with him. Is it not the relentless grace of God that we see in chapter 21 and 22 that allows him to escape having been betrayed by Doeg the Edomite? And in chapter 23 and 24, it's that same grace and care and providence and sovereignty of God that ensures that he can be in the same cave as Saul and escape and also go up a different valley from Saul and escape in Zeph. Friends, we may face relentless pressure from the world and the flesh and the devil, all tending to get us down, but we have a God of unrelenting, unswerving love and grace who is ever strengthening us and ever helping us. We must be ever looking to him and ever depending upon him, ever seeking him and his grace and prayer. What wonderful promises the Lord gives us in so many places. And yet sometimes, like David, we, we forget about them. Even take that, that most well-known Psalm 23. You remember how in verses 4 and 6, that, that ever-present protection of God and care of God is described. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And then in verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. The, the Hebrew word means pursue me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David wrote that. But he had forgotten that. We dare not forget that. As we face the hostility we were thinking about this morning, we must not forget that God is with us. It's very interesting. You can perhaps take time to look at this uh, after the service this evening. The people in Haggai's day that we looked at this morning made the exact same mistake as David made here in chapter 27. And if you read on in chapter 1 and into chapter 2 of Haggai, you'll see that the Lord commands them, consider your ways and build a temple. And what's the encouragement that he gives to them in the rest of chapter 1 and into chapter 2? I am with you. I am with you. Read through Ezra and Nehemiah, and you'll see that they, they, they successfully rebuilt the temple and eventually the walls as well because the good hand of the Lord was with them. That's the, the phrase that comes up time again. Christ has promised to be unswervingly with us no matter what happens to us. I am with you to the end of the age. The God who is ever with us is greater in power and love than any enemy, any pressure, any temptation. So that's the first 
problem that we see in David. He, he uh, is facing this relentless pressure, but he has forgot about the, the relentless grace of God that is with him. Secondly, we see in David a failure to hope in God's power to change things. We see a failure to hope in God's power to change things. David said in his heart, now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. And then look what he says, there is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. There is nothing left. There's nothing better for me. There are no other options, David says. Saul's attacks are relentless, that's true. But we would have to say to David, really? Were there no, was, there, was there no other possibilities left than fleeing to the Philistines that hate you? This is surely an attack of unbelief and doubt in God's power. David does not at this point in his life appear to account for, for God at all at this point. God has been so good to him, so gracious to him, has worked in him and with him so powerfully. But what does David do at this point? He loses hope in that God. He loses hope that God can do anything to change this situation for the better. He doesn't mention God at all, actually, in these verses. He pits all his hope in the Philistines of all people. Brothers and sisters, do you ever do that? Are you ever tempted to limit what God can do? Are you ever tempted to think that the situations that you face in your life are beyond God's power? We would never say that, of course. But do we sometimes think it? When you look at this great virus, or certainly when it was at its worst, did you think, even in your mind, that there's nothing can stop this? When you look at the moral climate of our land and the decisions that Westminster is making, do you think that can never change? There's no hope. It's beyond recovery. But friends, if God is alive and God is the ever eternal living God, if God is alive, there is always hope. Always hope. There is always hope that God may change the situation. There's one thing we can be sure of. God can change the situation. But we must never lose hope in God. We must never lose sight of his infinite power. Can God change the abortion laws in this land back again, or even improve them even more than they were before? Can God do that? Yes, of course he can. Can God change the hearts of our uh, MLAs and our, our uh, MPs over in Westminster and the many of the law lords over in, in, in the House of Lords? Can God change their mind about these things? Yes, he can. Can God do away with the godlessness and the iniquity in our land and the corruption and the dishonesty? Yes, he can. Can God make our marriages stronger so that we avoid the ravages of divorce and so forth? Can God change the, the, the minds of the people and turn them back to himself? Yes, he can. Can God cause his church to grow? Can he purify his church? Can he use us to bring about some of these changes? Yes, he can. Can God change your family and personal and work circumstances for the better? Yes, he can. Can God change your ability and improve your ability to fight your sin and fight temptation and be faithful? Yes, he can. Just as surely as he could have rescued David without him going down to the Philistines. But the challenge to us is, will we trust him? Will we believe in him? Will we pray to him? Will we fervently ask him to change these things? Or will we be like David, just give up? Paul has something to say on this issue, hasn't he? In Ephesians 3 verse 20, 
He addresses God as him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think according to the power at work within us. That's quite a challenge, isn't it? What would you love to happen to improve your holiness and Christ-likeness? What would you love to have? What, what do you dream could happen in this land and in this world? Think of the, the, the most impossible thing that you can think of. Paul says God can do that. It doesn't matter what we can think of. God can do more than that, Paul says. David need never have said, there is nothing left. There is always plenty left with God. And even if God chooses not to change any of the things that we have said, can he not give you and I the strength and the grace to persevere faithfully until he comes or until he takes us to be with him? Yes, he can. He is the one who supplies every spiritual grace. David falls into discouragement and despair. Why? Because he took his eye off God. He forgot what God had already done for him. He had forgot God's ever-present love and care for him. And therefore, he forgot what God could do for him. He forgot that God is infinite in power and glory and holiness and goodness. These are dangers that could afflict us, especially as we face the relentless pressure of wickedness around us. Let us renew our faith in God. Renew our faith in the grace of God, in the almighty power of God. Will we hope in God with confidence that we will praise him yet? Our saviour God is he. May God help us to trust in his unrelenting grace and power in what seems to be a day of unrelenting hostility and opposition. May God bless his word to us this evening. Amen. Well, let us take our psalters and we end our time together today by singing from Psalm 91. Psalm 91, version A. And we're singing stanzas one through to six and our tune is number seven, communion. Psalm 91a, one to six, and tune seven, the words will be up on the screen as normal. And here, of course, we uh, have uh, the, we have thought this evening about troubles and trials and opposition. Well, this psalm assures us that just as David did, as Paul did, as Christ did, that while we will face trials and troubles, we are also in the hands of an almighty protecting God. We are safe. Even death for the Christian is the doorway to new, renewed, perfect life. Stanza one states the fact very simply and straightforwardly. The man, the woman, the young person, the child who in the sheltered place of the Most High dwells by his grace will with the almighty God abide and in his shadow safely hide. That's the fact. And then in stanza two, the psalmist turns our minds and our tongues to confess that. Let's believe these words as we sing them this evening. Let us say, yes, that's correct. I therefore to the Lord will say, he is my refuge, my sure stay. And then stands us three to six, go through a catalogue of terrors, a catalogue of things that could possibly happen to us. But nothing, nothing can separate us from that care of God. To put it into New Testament terms, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. So let's sing together these words. Stanzas 1 to 6, 
Psalm 91, version A, June 7, communion. Let us praise God. Let's conclude in prayer. Our Lord and Father, what a wonderful assurance it is to hear that in every circumstance of life that you will never abandon us. Time and again throughout the Psalms, throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Gospels and the Epistles as well, we are urged to believe this truth, that nothing Nothing can separate us 
from your love, which has worked towards us through Jesus Christ. Violence, famine, persecution, any hostility whatsoever, nothing is outside of your control. Nothing is outside of your conquering hand. And so we pray, Lord, that we would never lose sight of this, that you are with us, that you have been with us and that you shall ever be with us, whether it be as individuals, as your people, or as the church of Jesus Christ. Help us also to be people of prayer as we face the circumstances that we face that seem impossible to change. Help us to remember that you are the infinite God. You are the God who can change things radically. We thought this morning about how you even changed the heart of Cyrus the king to desire to build your temple. That would have been a, a totally impossible thing to visualize or to think could ever happen, but it did happen. So we pray, Lord, make us people of believing prayer that we might see and witness your glory in changing the things that are happening in our land. We pray, Lord, you would come and work in the lives of politicians and people alike, that they would turn to you with faith and trust and in obedience. We pray, Lord, you will be with us throughout this week. Help us to face the things that we must face, whether good or bad. Keep us humble and keep us depending upon you and your grace in everything. Bless us, we pray, as we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.